This is the Savvy Investor Podcast. Hey there, Savvy Investors. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Savvy Investor Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate investing, provide you guys with invaluable market insights and expert advice to help support you to live the Savvy Investor life. I'm your host, Mike Potty, founder of Savvy Investor and longtime Canadian real estate investor. And today's discussion, today's podcast is about a favorite topic of mine, which is multifamily investing. I love this investment strategy. And it is super, super popular with our investing community right now, and rightfully so. We're seeing vacancies at an all-time low, rents are up drastically, and when you're seeing those combinations together, it can provide a lot of this great money, especially when you are taking into account using the Burr method when it comes to apartment buildings. Um, many people understand Burr from a single family space, uh, but when you're doing in this multifamily space, boy, can it be magical. You can make a lot of money. And the goal here when it comes to multifamily is to increase the net operating income to increase the value of the property. And it sounds easy enough, you know, I'm gonna improve the unit, can do some renovations, raise the rents, reduce expenses, and bingo, made a lot of money, giddy up, right? This is, this is exactly what we're looking for. But is there more to it than that? Would we possibly look at other opportunities to increase net operating income to make some additional money? So to go into this a little bit more, we've brought in Mayu Thava, who's been specializing in this investment strategy for several years now. He was initially an accountant by trade. And so you know he's gonna be paying very close attention to the numbers, which is good. We're gonna get a chance to see it from that perspective. So in this episode, we dive deep to learn a little bit about Mayu's real estate investing journey, how he started from pre-construction condos to begin with before discovering the power of Burr strategy with multifamily investing. Mayu's transition from investing to the great from the greater Toronto area to exploring other markets like Windsor and New Brunswick, which has also been a very popular market as well. The importance of purchasing undervalued assets and executing a strategic renovation strategy based on market demand. And at the same time, buying the right property at the right price to ensure maximum profitability. If you're looking to get into multifamily investing or are looking at ways to better yourself as an investor, you're going to really enjoy this episode. So before we jump in, we'd like to highlight this episode's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by our Savvy Investor Trusted Partner, Mogul Realty. Is Edmonton in your radar to invest in right now? Rightfully so, as it's one of the hottest real estate markets in Canada at the moment. But do you have the right real estate team to help you find that perfect investment property? Look no further than Mogul Realty. With a long track record of investing themselves, they are experts when it comes to supporting real estate investors that are looking to acquire both residential and commercial properties in Edmonton. If you are looking for experience and knowledge to add to your investment team in Edmonton, connect with the Mogul Realty team to help support you in finding the right investment property. To learn more or to connect with Mogul Realty, visit the show notes with the link to their website. Welcome, everybody. we got another great episode here on the Savvy Investor Podcast, and i got a great guest today, Maya Thava, all the way from back east, Ontario. How's it going, Mr. Maya? <laughs> doing good, doing good. How are you, Michael? And where are you located? I'm based in Vancouver. Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Don't even yeah. know that. <laughs> not, 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 as, not as cold as what you guys are dealing with, right? Yeah, um, no, th this February hasn't been bad, but... Uh... You know, some other ones are oh, <laughs> awesome. awesome. here. Yeah, awesome. doing good though, doing good. Very good. So guys, uh, we brought Maya on today because, uh, uh, oh, sorry, Mayu on today because we're really excited to hear some about his journey. He's got a great social media on his Instagram page. Make sure you check that out. Uh, just give him the handle, uh, Mayu, if you don't mind. Just yeah, so it's, it's, it's Mayu.Tava, so M-A-Y-U dot T-H-A-V-A. -A. Uh, we'll mention it at the end of the podcast as well, but uh, that's where most of my content and everything kind of originates from. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that, especially when it comes to social media and growing your business. But again, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to bring him on. Uh, he's done an amazing job. He's been an investor for a little while here too. And and, and maybe, well, let's let's get right into it, Mayu. It's like, maybe just share a little bit about your investing journey. You know, these people have not heard about you. Um, but I think a lot of people will resonate. They're just talking about, you know, for yourself, doing a lot of burrs. And, and, and maybe let's talk about your strategy and how you've kind of grown in this business. Yeah, sure. I'll give you, I'll give you my quick, quick synopsis bio. So, 
Um, graduated 2015, started investing almost right away. I was living at home with my parents, did, had a little bit of OSAP student debt, um, but at that time bought a pre-construction condo because that's all I really knew in, in, in as far as the world of investing. Um, bought that one. My girlfriend, now wife, bought another one. Um, and then 2017, we bought another property in the GTA as well. So we really started off in the GTA. Um, didn't really know anything about kind of traditional like burr investing or anything like that. Um, it was just live at home, penny pinch, scrounge it together, right? Uh, around 2018, kind of started hearing about the burr strategy. Thought it existed more so in like London and kind of like the US markets and these further away markets. So kind of brushed it off until uh, someone, I met someone that was doing it in Toronto. Uh, so I did it on a bungalow in Toronto and Scarborough um, and that worked out well, but there was a decent amount of net investment. Like it was, it was, you know, you're still putting out a lot of your capital, but because the capital required for Toronto is so large, you still leave yeah. in a decent amount of capital, even if it's only 5% of your investment. Right. Um, so then from there, I, I, you know, went looking for other markets to invest in, started doing Windsor. I got my proof of concept in Windsor, Ontario. Um, as soon as I did one one perfect burr, then I just kind of went ham with it and, and started raising capital and uh, bought up as much as we could between 2019 and the end of 2020. Um, after that, I uh, well, I was working as a as a CA the entire way through in the big four, so I was at Ernst and Young for a while, um, and then transitioned into the world of full time like real estate investing. Uh, so we started doing some flips. Um, we moved our investment strategy into the commercial multifamily space. Um, did New Brunswick at that time. Uh, and then I also got my mortgage license. So I started doing mortgage brokering for a lot of other people. The intent was just to do it for myself, started doing it for other people. I just kind of blew up there. Uh, and then from there, we've, um, you know, we've scaled to doing about 100 transactions a year on the mortgage side. Uh, we pulled back on the flipping just because the risk reward didn't really start to make a whole lot of sense for us after a while. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're still buying multifamily uh, buildings today. We're sitting at around uh, just over like 50 units. Yeah, I, I never give like an exact number because randomly we'll sell off like a duplex and then we'll buy something else. And I'm like, it's just constantly changing, right? Like even right now I've got things up for sale. So yeah, it's, um, it's been a journey. It's been a good one. <laughs> good. Yeah. And I think that I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's just like, you know what you, it's always a common question. How many doors do you have? Well, it just depends. Like there's properties that you're buying and selling constantly, especially when you're in the business, as long as I've been doing it, it's just, it's crazy. So, so, you know, you're, you're, you're highlighting some of the things that you've done with your burr strategy. You've transitioned over to the commercial end of things. Um, maybe just share a little bit about burring. And, and I think that's for a lot of people. Um, I'm making the assumption you're burring some residential properties to start with. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, for sure. The very first burr we did was a uh, single family duplex conversion in Scarborough. Um, and, and that worked really well. It was uh, during that period of uh, post 2017, where they implemented the stress test. So there was a lot less competition kind of reminds me of 2023, right? Um, but you were able to get in, make decent offers, less competition, right? Um, so you go in, you buy a single family house, you convert it into two unit dwelling. Uh, and then you do the refinance and it, it took me two refinances and about a year and a half to pull out all of my capital there. But, um, you know, we, we eventually got out that capital um, and, and, you know, you're increasing the value of the property. So for anyone that doesn't know the burr, and I'm assuming a lot of your, your you know, your, your group probably knows the burr, right? Um, but you're essentially just buying undervalued assets. You're doing strategic renovations to increase the value of those assets. You're then refinancing, renting it out and, uh, you know, just kind of continuing the cycle. Um, that, that first project in Scarborough though, I think the total amount of capital that we maybe injected was around like 240,000. We got that from selling off one of those pre-cons that we had bought earlier on, um, which is fine, but the net investment ended up at like 60 or $70,000. doesn't sound like a big deal. Like, you know, relatively speaking, you're talking about a million dollar asset leaving 60 or $70,000 there should be okay. Right. The, the problem comes when you think about scaling and you're like, Hey, if I'm going to leave 60 to $70,000. Like I barely had the 240,000 that was required for this project, but if I keep leaving 50 to 60,000, then I'm going to run out of capital very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's where Windsor kind of came into play because when I was running my numbers, I figured the worst case numbers here was a net investment about, you know, 6,000, $7,000. Um, at the time we had just gotten married, me and my wife. Um, and so our savings rate was about two to 3,000 a month. Um, you know, dual income, no kids, living for rent and, you know, low cost of, uh, of lifestyle, right? Um, so if, if you're saving two to 3,000 a month, the logic was a bird takes you about six months. And during those six months, I would have accumulated another 18,000. 
And so even if I leave $6,000 in this property, I'll never run out of capital. I just keep training it, right? Um, so that was kind of that, that transition uh, into more affordable markets. And it kind of worked out really well for us, for sure. Very, very good. So you, it's interesting because a lot of people talk about the burst strategy and, and it's just always that kind of rinse and repeat. And, and, and there's a lot of perception that you're going to pull all your money back. And that's, and that's not always the case. You're probably going to be leaving a little bit of, a little bit back in, in, in the deal in itself. Um, and that's been your experience as well. Is that, is that true? Yeah, for sure. I, I always tell people, especially like my mortgage clients, I say, look, you, we target like a 5% net investment, right? I think if you're leaving a 5% net investment, you're on a 20 X leverage, right? Uh, if that 5% is too much for you, then you're probably not doing the right asset class, right? That's just like, it's kind of like my logic when I was doing Toronto, 5% was too much because that's 50 grand. But when I go to Windsor and I'm talking about 200K houses, 5% is about like 10 grand, which is a lot more reasonable for me, right? Um, so, you know, we target 5%. We did hit perfect birds for sure. Like in the 2020, 2021, 2022 run up. Yeah, we, we were, you know, doing birds plus taking out a little bit more and, and stuff like that, right? But in a normal market cycle, that is not the case. And like I said, there's that misconception that, you know, you're going to be able to pull all your capital back, which is not all, always the case. You might be lucky, especially if the market's starting to appreciate, like we, like to your point, 2020, 2020, 2021, those markets are just taken off like crazy shortly after COVID. And um, with that being said, you know, you're able to really take advantage of, of, of that uplift. So let, let's get into some of the burrs and, and, and specifically you're talking about strategic renovations. And, you know, for myself, I'm not a renovation guy by any means. I, I, I hired the people that kind of facilitate that especially in the multifamily side, when you talk like strategic renovations, what were some things that you were, you know, that made sense? How do you distinguish what's the right strategy uh, for renovating to get the perfect burr? Cause you know, there's a, there's a kind of a mixed bag to this thing. You don't want to over renovate too. And there's, and you don't want to under, under renovate too. So what were some of the things you did? How did you determine were uh, the right things to be renovating to get your full value back out of the, out of uh, the refinance? Yeah, it, it comes down to a understanding of like, what is the market that I'm that I'm investing in? And what is a market value, right? Uh, so in Toronto, um, you know, you're fine if you put in quartz countertop, put in a new kitchen and new cabinets and new bathrooms, tiles, everything, right? Uh, the market expects it, the market um, values it, the rental grade will improve, right? Um, there, there's certain things that you could just do and it's going to be valued, like buying a single family house and adding a basement unit. Uh, the numbers support it, right? Like there is an ARV that supports it. Now, when you go to Windsor, if you bought at that time, if you bought a single family house and if you spent 70 grand even to add a basement unit, you're crazy because the comps won't support it. Like a single family is 200 grand and a duplex was 240, right? So, um, you know, you just got to know the market that you're going into. And then it's, you know, no matter what you do to the single family house, it's not going to be worth $500,000. Like it's going to cap out at about 280. And you're buying it for like 190, for example, right? So you're talking about maybe like a 90K spread between purchase and refinance value. Uh, so the objective is to get it to that 280, 290K valuation with minimal renovation. So uh, strategic renovations in Windsor is very often uh, paint. Uh, you don't throw out any kitchen cabinets unless they're absolutely terrible, right? <laughs> you paint the kitchen cabinets as well. Um, you, you can put some LVP flooring in on top of tiles because you don't have the money to pay for the demo of the tiles, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's really kind of penny pinching in a certain way, recognizing that no matter what I do, this property is not going to be worth a certain amount of dollars unless I build it new, right? Um, and so it's strategic in that sense. And then when you go when you go out to like New Brunswick, which we, uh, when we were doing the uh, commercial multifamilies, we were doing New Brunswick, those guys have really mastered strategic renovations. We were turning over units for like $4,000, $5,000, right? Just like paint wow. a little bit of flooring in the area that needs new flooring. You don't touch the rest of the flooring, right? Because New Brunswick was dealing with, you know, 50, 60K per unit prices for a very long period of time. Today it's different, right? Today you're yeah. talking about 150 or so, but, yeah. um, and so when you're dealing with 50, 60 K units, you cannot spend 20, 30 grand renovating. It doesn't make any sense, right? So um, it's just very much understanding what is my end value, right? And what what is that value based on? So studying the comps then determines what kind of strategic renovations are actually valuable here. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, it's a little bit of reverse engineering. Is that correct? I'm saying that it's just like, you know, understanding your comparables first, like see what this thing's going to be, you know, understanding what renovations you're able to do, what you can do. And it sounds like you're putting a lot of suites in, in some of the buildings to, to do the burst strategy properly. And then in addition, 
it's what's the value going to be be after you've done those renovations and uh one of the questions is how what's the importance of getting this property purchased at a right price is it an important important thing to take yeah 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 hundred percent hundred percent that is everything right um th that that's what makes the perfect burr if anything right um now, what I always tell people is like when you're doing renovations, if you spend one dollar in renovations, you should be increasing the value of the property by two dollars at the bare minimum, right? Or you might as well just bought the turnkey asset, right? Why are you doing all this work for no reason? Um, so, so you know, strategic renovations is important, but making money on the buys is equally as important, I would say, right? Um, and one thing that I'm now blanking on what I was going to say, <laughs> and another point to make, but. Um, that's okay. Oh, oh yeah. So studying the comps, right? Like, especially when you're flipping, right? When you're flipping, it's like, it's very important because what, like in Toronto, for example, if you buy a single family house, uh, very common, you'll have a three bedroom layout um, and then you'll have a dining room and you have a living room. So it's very valuable in certain pockets to take that dining room, make it into a bedroom. And now you've got a four bedroom layout in Windsor going from three to four, not really that valuable because you don't have the same new immigrant student kind of like population and demand that Toronto has in, in certain pockets of Windsor in certain areas for sure you do like if you're near the university and stuff like that uh, so the question is just like hey like how much does that four units uh the four bedroom sell for versus a three bedroom sell for right and, and let's just say that spread is 50 grand if it's going to cost you 50k to make that fourth bedroom it doesn't make any sense it's going to cost you 10k there you go perfect makes sense right so um, everyone, whether I'm coaching them or I'm, I'm doing, you know, mortgages with them, I just tell them, Hey, look, have you studied the cons? Cause that's one thing that we did religiously. Right. Um, we had a list of like all sales and kind of categorize it based on the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and, uh, you got to know your comps better than the realtors. That's the reality. Of it. Yeah. I, I agree with that hundred percent. And, and again, I hope everybody's paying attention to this is the, to kind of really determine what your valuation is going to be is the comparables are so, so absolutely crucial. Like you really do need to know it. And you know, the acquisition side is extremely important. You got to, you got to be looking at both ends of this. You got to say, okay, what am I doing? What are we going to be able to sell this thing for uh, after the renovations have come to completion? And what am I going to be able to purchase it for to make it worth our while? So when you're looking at spreads, um, are you like, what, what are you looking for? So as let's just say you're determining kind of a, a single family property and we'll get into the multifamily space in a second. But when you were looking at spreads, what were some of the things that you were looking for that was important to you? Uh, spread is probably not the right like metric, right? Because you can buy. Yeah, or the equity side, like I guess the profit side, I should say more profit side. What, what, what were profits that you were, you would say is, is a reasonable profit uh, from a burst strategy, from a flip or or, or sorry. From a flip or what would was the percentage you were looking to get back from the refinance was it always like 95 percent? is that the objective normally uh yeah <laughs> so so you know you go through different kind of like phases in your investing right so um <laughs> it's funny it's a good question actually because like in 2020 when we were in kind of that growth stage we didn't have um a, you know a very big portfolio maybe like five or six or seven properties, right? And so you're focused on growth. So you really need to take out every single dollar, right? And so my my like headset, like dead set, like focus was I need every single dollar out of this property. And I will cut corners wherever I need to cut corners to make sure I get every single dollar out and I will push off this problem to the future. Yeah. So we didn't do furnaces, we didn't do windows, we didn't do roofs because appraisers, they don't really care about it. Appraisers kind of like see what they see, right? Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, we, we suffer the consequence of that as well, right? And that's why I say it's a very good question that you ask because uh, to this date, uh, I had a, uh, a basement flood because we didn't, you know, we, we didn't drain the, drain the sewage lines and stuff like that because we were cutting corners back then, right? Um, we didn't, we didn't uh, do exterior waterproofing, which a lot of people would do, right? Um, you know, we, we cut certain corners, which resulted in bills down the road, but it allowed us to maximize the capital that we took out at that time, which helped us grow. Right. right. Um, so pros and cons today, I go the opposite way where I'm like, you know what? I don't need to pull out all my, all my money, but I want less headaches. Yeah. Right? And I just need a clean portfolio. That's not going to have unexpected cash calls in the future. Cause one thing when you've got five properties and you get cash calls, okay, what's the worst case that'll happen. It's another thing when you've got 50 units and you've got, you know, this literally like this last week, I posted, a, I posted something on my Instagram about it today. It was, you know, we had a, a, on our eightplex of basement flooded. We had on our triplex of foundation issue, which is a result of poor exterior water management. Our Airbnb ran out of heat because a propane company never came and filled it up. Uh, and we had like four or five different issues, right? So 
Um, you know, some, some weeks are crickets and some weeks are not, right? But to answer your question, going back to the burn, uh, at that point in my time in 2020, 2021, it was pull out all the capital. Today, it's more so I just want to make sure I've got a good quality asset when I'm done with this. And if I can do that and end up with about a 5% net investment, I'm very happy with that. Uh, the, the second metric that we do track, though, is ultimately like what's your cash on cash, right? So if you're leaving a certain amount of money in the property, um, what's that going to be as a cash on cash? My metric uh, used to be 10%. Uh, if I could get 10% or higher, I was very happy because those were private lending rates, right? So I looked at it as... You know, not only am I not private lending and I'm getting the same rate of return, but now I've got the asset and control it as well. Um, and that was the reason we stopped flipping, right? Because we were flipping and when I looked at my rate of return, it was very similar to private lending rates of return. Private lending, you have, I wouldn't say no risk, like it's, it's a different type of risk, right? Um, but you definitely don't have to do nearly as much work as when you're flipping. And you don't take, in my opinion, as much risk as when you're flipping either. Right, right. Makes sense. Like makes total sense. Yeah. So yeah. You, you've kind of done the evolution. You you did well in the single family space, and not only did you change uh, investment strategies, you also kind of changed markets. And and I think you took a lot of your burring experience from single family over to multifamily. Just tell us about you know I guess why did yeah. you why did you pivot to a different market, different investment strategy completely, and some of the experiences that you've brought over to, to, to do this. I'll be honest. Like there's a lot of people that are, are in the single family space right now. And they're just like, I want to get into multifamily. It's just this really a big appeal, bigger, bigger scale. So maybe just share a little bit about what, why, and, and, and what you did in, in regards to your transition to, to multifamily and also changing markets as well. Yeah, we, we, we switched to New Brunswick in, I want to say it was like late 2020 or something like that. Um, we closed our purchases early 2021. Uh, so, you know, the switch to New Brunswick, it's not that we didn't know New Brunswick had existed, uh, but it was more so if we, I, I wanted to switch into commercial because I was also leaving my job. So I knew, um, I've always done investing as I will bring on partners if it makes sense. Uh, but I want to be in a position of power where I don't need you as a partner, right? So. I can always just buy this on my own or you can come along for the journey if you want. Like no, no pressure. If you don't want to, that's completely fine. Of course. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I knew as soon as like to this day, I have no real estate on my personal name. It's all corporations tucked away, different structures, stuff like that. Right. So even today, if I go out and I buy a fourplex, I could very confidently say I can qualify for this fourplex on my own. And if a partner doesn't want to come along, cool. Right. But when I was leaving my job, I knew I was going to lose that flexibility. I knew I was not going to be able to qualify for the mortgage anymore for at least like a year, two years, maybe. Right. Um, so what that meant was if I wanted to continue to scale up, I'd have to go for commercial real estate uh, or do flips and stuff like that. So when I knew I wanted to go for commercial real estate, the question then just became commercial real estate makes very logical sense. It's pure numbers. I come from a, a CA audit accounting background. That was like my entire like it, it made the most sense to me, even more sense than residential real estate. The problem, and you guys have the same issue in BC, the problem that I was seeing is the entire thing is dependent on net operating income. What is my net operating income going to be? So exactly. If I need to increase net operating income, and people will tell you that you can decrease expenses, but there's only so much you can really do on the expense side. Maybe like chip away a little bit of yeah, insurance, true. a little negotiate with the yeah. city for property yeah. tax. It's all revenue, realistically. Right. Um, so in Ontario, the revenue question is a big question mark because I could underwrite this deal, assuming 30 percent tenant turn turnover. I could assume 100 percent. I could assume 5 percent, but it's ultimately just a guess unless you're able to negotiate vacancies with the tenants prior to close or while mm -hmm. it's period. Right. right? So right. that was too much risk for me because I still didn't have much capital. And I was kind of going at this uh, initially. I started off alone and then I ended up bringing on one of my other partners. Um, but I was looking at it as a loan, so I had like two to three hundred k in capital. So I'm like, if I put this in the wrong deal in Ontario, then I'm done. Like, you know, you got to just sit sit on your ass and wait, right? Um, and, and so I started looking at uh, markets that where where you can increase the rents, more favorable landlord rules. And then the other reason I went to New Brunswick was this was around the time in 2020. I remember now it was a time in 2020 when the government was saying, uh, you know, if you can't pay your rent, don't pay your rent. I was like. Yeah. yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> yeah. So crazy. I can't, I still can't, it's just unfathomable for them so to say like, that. Okay. But anyway, yeah. keep going. <laughs> so I was like, I'm, I'm about to get screwed if they do that, right? Like if, if, if across the portfolio, they stop paying rent. Well, that's really so much, so much you can stomach, right? So I realized I got to pivot to a market where you have a little bit more rules for a little bit of diversification, right? 
Um, so it was New Brunswick or Alberta. Uh, those are kind of the two markets that stood out at that time. Alberta is heavy oil and gas. Uh, so I decided to go New Brunswick route, right? Um, New Brunswick, uh, Moncton was kind of on my radar. Uh, and then my partner was actually looking in St. John. And then we just decided we would do it together, but we'd buy one in each city. So we bought an eight-plex there and a seven-plex there. And you can increase the rents at that time. Uh, you just have to give like a reasonable notice, like three months or so. Now it's a little bit different, right? Like six months or so. Um, but... Uh, you know, we were able to execute on that, no problem, turned it over within the course of a year. So we bought a seven and an eight uh, in New Brunswick, and then I bought a nine plex in Ontario, and then I bought a seven plex. So, I, you know, I, I like to say I go up to the 10 units. The single families don't make any sense for me from a, from a time perspective for me now, right? Um, but we did buy like a duplex or a triplex, I guess, in uh, uh, late 2022. We bought a cottage, right? So you, you, I'll still play in those markets if it makes sense. It's kind of like an easy deal, right? Uh, but if it's going to take my time, it makes more sense to spend it on, you know, six plus, five plus, at least like units, right? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Like I said, I think for a lot of people, this is a normal transition, especially when you're able, when you learn how to properly uh, understand valuations in a multifamily space. There's just so many ways you can actually increase the value there, even in a down market, right? So it's 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 nuts. So your 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 accounting background, I'm sure that's paid huge dividends in understanding that multifamily space. And I guess you you referenced net operating income. And I think this is important because I saw, I'm not sure if you saw this too, Mayu, but uh, back in 2020, 2021, we saw a massive influx of people, investors getting into the multifamily space in Moncton. I was an investor there too. And I saw some, a lot of red flags all over the place. And it was really about a lot of residential investors getting into the multifamily space, not necessarily knowing what the hell they were doing and seeing you know, properties purchased at some crazy prices in some cases. I, I Maybe you can highlight from, from, you know, your accounting background and how that's paid dividends in regards to understanding this business in multifamily and the importance of of understanding net operating income when it, go, when it comes to multifamily. Because I think this is important for a lot of residential investors yeah. looking to pivot that they need to understand. It's funny that you say that, Michael. Like my, my personal thought the entire way through was, uh, my accounting designation isn't really helping me with jack shit, right? Um, <laughs> until you like talk to a couple of other people that maybe don't have the same background that didn't go to business school, right? Um, so, so I always say like real estate is an industry that everyone comes in with their own skill set, right? Like you could have worked in the trades and then you pivoted over to real estate and you've got an advantage over me coming from an accounting background. You could have worked as a realtor or wholesaler pivoting into the investing side and you've got a different like experience as well, right? Um, for me as an accountant, yeah, like the, the numbers definitely like make a lot of sense to me. They're, they're a lot easier to comprehend and understand, right? Um, I, I don't think it's super complex. I don't think real estate is one of those things that's super complex, right? But it's more so the macroeconomic understanding that kind of helps a little bit around like along the way, right? Kind of understanding like if interest rates are going up, what is the natural event that's gonna to happen to cap rates? Cap rates will start to kind of move up across the markets, right? Kind of similar to in 2020, 2021, when the interest rates were going down, we saw a lagged effect as cap rates kind of came down. We've seen the opposite transpire in 2023, right? Um, so, you know, having that economics understanding helps a little bit. I wouldn't say it's drastic. Uh, having the corporate tax kind of understanding helps me kind of, you know, bridge the gap between like financing and taxes essentially because that's 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 the devil that everyone kind of has to deal with right hey do i optimize for taxes or do i optimize for financing and yeah you know, the right answer is you optimize for different ones based on where you are in your cycle right um so you know it, it's definitely it, it's not that it's a disadvantage it's not a huge advantage it's not something everyone needs and you can obviously pay for an account at the time as well it's kind of a shortcut um but it's important to look at yourself and go hey like what's my unique unique kind of like value proposition I think everyone has something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Now, you know, the one thing that's really interesting is you're also a mortgage broker too, right? And uh, it looks like you've been recognized as a, as, as a, a, an up and coming rising star. You just recently <laughs> won an award to this. Yeah. So obviously there's some, there's some value understanding the financing side of the world. And I guess since you've started this, this real estate investing journey, um, what have you learned when it comes to the financing side? Any major changes that have happened that that's really um, resonated or adjusted your strategy a little bit when it comes to investing in real estate, uh, both commercial and residential? Yeah, um, covers this a few different ways, I guess. So like understanding, even as an investor, like before I went into the world of mortgage brokering, um, understanding financing was, was key for me, right? Because when we're bringing on joint venture partners, A, I can't send every JV partner I have to a broker 
the broker is eventually just going to get annoyed with me because you know they're doing the filtering for me, right? <laughs> so so we had to do the first round of filtering, which is like, hey, like what do you do for a living? Oh, you're salaried, okay? Like ballpark, how much do you make? How many properties do you have? Oh, like how many mortgages do you have on those? And and the moment someone tells you a hundred k, but I've got like a primary residence worth about a million dollars, like shit, okay, it's probably not going to work, mm-hmm. right? And you kind of like try to filter, and you need to know this JV partner could work for commercial, and this JV car partner could work for residential, or maybe this guy's only good for flips, right? You need to know kind of where to allocate potential partners that come into your life as well. So we had a, I had already had like a decent understanding, I'd say, of financing, um, and, and that realm of things. Um, but moving into mortgage brokering, it, it, it's it's definitely interesting. You see a lot of strategies across multiple markets, um, and I, anytime uh, like nine five percent of my clients are all like investors, right? Um, so and I at any time could just call up a client and say, hey, like you know you bought that property over here, like what's going on with that? Like I'm looking at this property over here, now, right? So it kind of like works out to your advantage. But to to be fair, like my clients have also benefited from me going, hey man, you need to put together an appraisal package and send it to me because this one. We're going to struggle on the valuation on this for sure. And, and so I need an appraisal mm-hmm. package here. I was like, did I just like zoom? Hey, you there? Yeah, okay. you're there. I got you now. You're going. Uh, no, I was just saying like my clients as well. Like, you know, so, sometimes we need to put together an appraisal package, right? And it's kind of like doing the exercise of like studying the comps for them and, and trying to help them make their case as to why their property is worth a certain amount of money, right? Um, or it's, you know, kind of like advising them when the leverage model is getting too high. So it, it, it kind of all fits together well, the accounting understanding with the mortgage brokering understanding with the real estate investing experience, right? It all kind of like kind of comes together into the brokering world. And um, if you guys are, are looking into the financing world or even being a realtor or a wholesaler, right? It comes back to just like, think about what your strengths are. And you, you, you do have to have a unique value proposition in a world that's like highly fragmented, highly competitive, um, with very low barrier to entry, right? Um, so I'd say that that's what's helped me on the mortgage side. And yeah, we, we had some great years and it's still going good. And this year's off to a pretty good start, I'd say. Um, that's, that's the other thing I'd say as well for anyone that's listening, like pick up the phone, talk to your realtors and your mortgage brokers, like get some boots on the ground information as to what are you seeing happening in the market? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like, especially like, you, you know, you look at the mortgage broker side of things, it's always changing, evolving, the new rules, new policies. Like you have to stay close with your investment team constantly. It's so, so crucial. Yeah. You know, I always say, make sure you take your mortgage broker out for lunch or coffee or something. Just get to uh, pick their brain of, of for a few moments when they have right. a little bit of time. Uh, but, you know, you in, during times like what we're seeing right now, it's so, so crucial to make sure you stay well connected with your investment team. There's opportunities everywhere, to be very honest with you. It's just you got to be able to stay close with your team and just explore it. So yeah. um, tell me a little bit about your direction. Where, where do you think you're going to be? What, what's kind of the plan for yourself in the next uh, in the next year in 2024? And how are you planning out 2024 for yourself? Yeah, yeah. What, one thing I'll add kind of in line, because what I'm trying to do is also in line with uh, your last question about policies and um, changes that we're seeing in the financing world as well. Uh, th- there's basically two things that I'll kind of point out. The residential side, like there's there's rumors about things changing, but not, nothing is really changing. The reality is like they're, they're not bringing out like a 40 year amortization amortization uh the entire HELOC is coming down to 65 percent loans of value that's blown out of proportion it's always existed there was just a small loophole that they've closed out right um so there's not too many changes on the residential side uh where there is changes is um cmhc mli select for commercial mortgages where uh, you have the ability to go up to a 50 year amortization and a 95 percent loan to value mortgage uh, whether it's on the buy or on the refinance, that has been uh, a game changer for multifamily real estate across Canada, right? Um, just because it, it completely changes the amount of capital that you can take out and, and doing the burr with it, right? Now, very few people are actually getting or or, or going to 95% um, because you still have to be able to debt service the, the, the mortgage and stuff like that, right? But even the 40 and 50 year amortizations alone, those are extremely valuable, right? Um, and the second thing I'll say is uh, the the construction and development space um, for ha- has changed drastically. So we do construction mortgages as well. Um, it used to be a lot of you know single family developments and stuff like that. Uh, now what the lenders and the government is really pushing on, and, and there's CMHC products for this as well. If you guys are interested, shoot me a message. But uh, what everyone's really focusing on is the construction of multifamily assets, right? Mm, yeah. um, Obviously, you're not going to do this in markets maybe that don't have a high after repair value because the cost of construction is still high. But in markets like Toronto, 
the strategy that everyone is doing is the entire four plus one, four, four units in the front, one guard and three in the back. One in the back. Five units, yep. ticket to CMHC, multi, uh, MLI select for the um, refinance, right? Um, that is basically the strategy that's working in a lot of large cities. Um, it is either taking advantage of MLI select or building your own asset and then taking it to MLI select as well. Mm. Right. Makes sense. Very, so very good. Both of those are the areas that I'm focusing on as well. <laughs> Sorry. Love Everybody. it. Nope. No, well, good. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, you, you know, you kind of watched your, your path and what you've done. And, and one of the things you were highlighting was, um, you know, obviously you, you, you did reference joint venture partners and, and growth in your business. And, and the one thing, one of the reasons why we brought you on here is, you know, you, you've got a great, great presence on social media and, and um, especially for investors right now, especially when they're trying to raise capital. Um, maybe you could share a little bit about the importance of social media right now for investors and business owners in, in this type of space, especially real estate investors, you know, for trying to get recognized, get visibility. It, it, are you finding success using social media to, to get some visibility your way? Maybe you could share a little bit about what you've been doing. Yeah, I've, I've almost done zero transactions with like people that have known me on like a personal level before, like the entire, I mean, not to say zero, like there's obviously a few, right? But a lot of like the friends and family that I grew up with, they were not in the investing space. They still are not in the, in the investing space at all, right? Um, a lot of my partners have come from social media. Now, the one thing I'll say about social media is it's definitely not for everyone. Um, and a lot of people either feel like they're like well-funded. And so they go, you know what? I don't need social media. What's the point? Uh, at some point, you will run out of capital, right? Um, and, and it goes right. back to that being in the position of, uh, of, of highest power, whatever, that, whatever I said earlier, right? Uh, you basically just want to be in a position where you don't need social media you don't need the followers you don't need the likes and the shares and the whatever and you're just putting out content for the sake of putting out content right and, and you have no ask and the longer you can kind of continue with that trajectory the further you will go and then at any point when you do need it you can switch it off right um that was my approach for a very long time as well right like we started i only started posting content um in like 2020 or something like that uh, and there's also been like an evolution to, to content right like we started off with blog posts and then we did uh, the podcast and then we did uh, proof of concept pictures and stuff like that and then you do these short form videos and and now it seems to be the trend is going to youtube and uh, more longer form to build a deeper community right so uh, you, know, you got to kind of follow the trends and, and kind of go with it but um, a lot of people don't want to do it and then they will start when they need to do it and that is the wrong approach that's wrong. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, you know, I think provide value, share value first and foremost, and, and the money will actually come. And that's the way I've always believed is you sell by not selling. The more value you tend to come, the more more people attra are attracted to you to kind of want to work with you as well. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Great advice and love this stuff. So um, always I love to ask these questions of our savvy investor uh, guest members. Um, you've been doing this for a while. If you went to share a word of wisdom to our listeners, what would that be based on the experiences that you've had? If there was one key, key lesson you can leave with them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I'd say, you know, don't be afraid to reposition your portfolio along the way, right? Like I, I think for a long time, I just thought every time I sold a property was like a failure, right? It's like, why am I selling yeah. this property? I'm running out of capital, so I need to sell this property. Uh, and so yeah. on and so on. Um, and, and, you know, we always hear don't be emotional about real estate and all those kind of advice, but, right? But it's very tough because you buy a property and you're thinking, I'm going to own this yeah, for dude. 20 years. And you're looking at your net worth that's moving the right direction. Then you, and something happens and you need to sell it, right? And then you view that as a huge setback. But the reality is, like, I don't own any of the properties that we started off with, actually, right? Um, I'm actually selling off properties now that we bought in 2019, 2020. And I'm using them to try and buy bigger multifamily, more purpose-built yeah. like multifamily apartment buildings, right? So don't ever be afraid to kind of like rebalance your portfolio. Uh, and the earlier you accept that, um, the, the better I think for you as well. Very good. Love it. Love it. So um, again, if people wanted to learn more about you, you've got a podcast as well. Maybe you can share yeah. a little bit about what uh, where, to, where to follow you and where to see you because they've got some great information. Their podcast is excellent as well too. So uh, Mayu, if you don't mind just sharing For sure. uh, where they can find yeah, you. We, yeah, we've got the Rise Real Estate Investing Podcast. Um, we've got our Instagram account, Rise Network. Um, we've got the Facebook group as well as around 7,000 members in there as well. It's just purely amazing questions. No selling, no promoting, no nothing, right? Um, the podcast, we've got guests on similar to this as well that um, have just built up their portfolio and kind of subject matter experts in, in various topics as well, right? So check us out there. You can check me out on Instagram, mayu.daba, M-A-Y-U dot T-H-A-D-A. 
Um, it's basically the same thing across every platform. So if you want to find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, it's all money. Love it. Love it, buddy. So listen, we'll put all the links in the description of the podcast as well for everybody and also on our YouTube channel. So um, my thank you. This is great. Really, really great informative stuff, to be very honest. And, and like I said, I think this resonates a lot with everybody that are trying to grow and scale their business. So really appreciate sure. you jumping thank in you. here appreciate and being part of the Savvy Investor on. Podcast. Thanks. Views and advice expressed on this podcast episode are solely those of the individuals participating and do not necessarily reflect the opinions or beliefs of the podcast host, its producers, or affiliated parties. All content shared is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as professional financial, legal, or investment advice. Listeners and viewers are strongly encouraged to conduct their own research and consult with qualified professionals such as financial advisors, lawyers, and accountants before making any financial decisions or investments based on the information provided in this podcast or any related content. The podcast host and producers disclaim any responsibility for any actions taken by listeners as a result of information presented in this episode. Viewer and listener discretion is advised.